Hello, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone online, wherever you are. Um, hello from Seattle, which is where I am right now. My name is Jessica Shear, and I will be your moderator for, for today's webinar on resilience. We're so glad you can join us. This is a par part of um, PATH's webinar series on understanding COVID-19 and um, on a particularly important topic, strengthening health system resilience during a crisis, is it possible? Before we get started, I wanted to run through a few logistics. Um, we want to hear from everyone during this conversation. And so at any time during the conversation, please feel free to insert questions in the chat or in the Q&A functions in Zoom. Also, you can join us um, by tweeting or uh, using the hashtag PathLiveForum or tagging us at, at PathTweets. This call is being recorded and distributed uh, to those who are attending um, and who, who, to those who are unable to attend. So I see that we have participants joining us from all over the world, philanthropists, government representatives, corporate partners, and peers. And we want to thank everyone for all that you're all doing in our communities right now um, from where I am in the United States and globally. And so again, the format for today's webinar will be fully question and answer. We'll be starting off with moderated question and answer between myself and the panelists, but then we will be shifting to audience Q&A. Um, we plan to have our videos up for most of the webinar. You'll see a few slides early on, but we will, we will go to videos soon so that you can see our panelists. So we wanted to just give you a bit of background about PATH in case PATH is new to you. So PATH is a global team dedicated to achieving health equity so all people and communities can thrive. Together, we are driving public health solutions that meet the most pressing needs of families, communities, and countries around the globe. We have a number of specialities ranging from vaccines, diagnostics, drugs, devices, and health system strengthening. And we are a global team working across 70 countries um, across the world and, and from a, a range of backgrounds uh, and very excited to be meeting with all of you today. So let's move into today's discussion topic. The topic of today's uh, webinar is resilience, which is such an important and timely topic right now during COVID-19. So the United Nations defines resilience as the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards or shocks to resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform, and recover from the effects in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions through risk management. And one of our speakers on the call today, um, Lucy Jelson, her and her colleagues have this quote from one of their recent papers on resilient. A resilient health system actively steers toward the state that continues to deliver good quality healthcare services within a changing environment. So when Lucy and her colleagues wrote this in 2017, this was obviously pre-COVID, but as Lucy can tell you, and as all of our panelists will tell you today, resilience is not something that just needs to happen during a shock, during a crisis. It's something that can be built, should be built every day, and should be constantly um, drawn upon as a characteristic of a health system within a constantly changing environment. So of course it is important um, almost more than ever now than before because of the extent of shocks that we're experiencing in our health systems and in our societies. So we want to do the very least during COVID of maintaining the delivery of essential health services. But we also want to see, can we strengthen the delivery of essential health services during this time? Is this perhaps an opportunity to think about how we adapt in different ways and how we potentially transform the delivery of essential health services, primary health care, to make them higher quality, more person-centered, um, and so that's something that we'll explore today. So if we go to our next slide. Much has been written in the resilience literature about resilience strategies, sometimes also called capacities, but essentially um, the literature says that there are these three main strategies. Actors and health systems might take on absorptive strategies, adaptive strategies, and transformative strategies. So absor absorptive strategies are where a system can absorb the shock and continue to maintain its essential core functions. Adaptive strategies are those 
that um, perhaps with fewer resources are able to adapt in the face of that and, and are able to maintain, in this, in this case, the delivery of essential health services. But it could also be that through these adaptations, these are positive, and they might actually strengthen the delivery of essential health services, make them better than they were before. And then finally, we have transformative strategies. And these are strategies that change the structure and functioning of the health system to deliver services in a new way. And again, these aren't always necessarily, um, don't necessarily have positive outcomes. We've seen that in the research as well and in experience. But when we can transform health systems and primary health care and essential health services in ways that are positive to strengthen them, it's something to really think about. So how do we get there? This is the big question. Um, so, so first of all, Previously, pre-COVID, there was a kind of understanding or assumption that the, the practice of these strategies really depended on the scale of the shock. So the more severe shock you had, the more likely you were maybe to need to use transformative strategies. Um, absorptive strategies could be used for more minor shocks. One thing that we've really kind of uh, dwelled on at PATH across the countries where we work and the communities that we work is that COVID is not a single shock. COVID is perhaps one large shock, but then it's many small aftershocks, many perturbations. Unlike anything before, COVID has really, really identified how dynamic and interconnected our health systems are and our societies. And so this is to say that we, we can't just apply one of these resilience strategies. There's not one right way to be resilient, but that we have to be drawing on many of them to address many of the small, medium, and large shocks that are occurring right now in our health systems. And so how do we get there? The important thing is for us to think about right now is in this context of COVID, of, of shock, um, how can we build the capacities of health systems, its stakeholders, its organizations, its individuals to be able to practice these resilience strategies? So uh, Lucy in, in some of her work and others have identified three resilience capacities. And these are capacities of organizations, but also of individuals. So we have the cognitive capacities, behavioral capacities and contextual capacities. And I'll define those on the next slide. And what we'd love to talk about today is how we can strengthen those, how they have been strengthened in the past and can be strengthened into the future. So cognitive capacities are those problem solving or sense making capacities, but also the existence of shared values and norms throughout a system and throughout organizations. Behavioral capacities are things like creativity, ingenuity, and we're hearing a lot about that when we're hearing about the, the great examples of resilience, particularly from communities. Um, but behavioral capacities are also the existing processes and institutions that encourage learning, right? That encourage the transfer of, of knowledge, of information, um, and of, of, of being resilient. And then finally, we have the contextual capacities, things like social capital embedded in networks, um, access to social networks and the, the kind of size and structure of networks across organizations and within organizations, and then access to resources, of course. So in today's webinar, <clears throat> You'll hear from, uh, um, from a number of experts on our, on our panel, as well as yourselves through the Q&A in the chat, about what we've learned from past crises, how we can take that forward to start now during COVID to strengthening the resilience of our health systems, of our communities, and of our societies. So I'm gonna introduce our speakers now. Um, we have Martin Alilio. Martin is a senior advisor in the Office of Health Systems at USAID and has extensive backgrounds um, uh, strengthening health systems for a number of different organizations, including the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. And we're really looking forward to hearing about Martin's kind of uh, lessons from, from past outbreaks and, and crises and what we can learn for the future and for today. Next, we have Lucy Gilson. Lucy is a professor. Um, at the University of Cape Town School of Public Health and Family Medicine. Lucy is uh, an exemplary health systems and social science researcher and has researched resilience of health systems as well as many other topics that are pertinent uh, to today's conversation. 
We also have with us Evelyn Oruku. Evelyn is a nurse in charge at the Megozi Subcounty Hospital in Kasumu County in Kenya and brings with her her expertise in, in primary health care and in um, the everyday resilience that is happening uh, and hopefully some bright spots from, from Kenya. And then next we have um, Dr. Samba Kolsar, uh, Dr. Yusufa Njai, who is the Director of Planning Research and Statistics at the Ministry of Health and Social Action in Senegal, was unfortunately unable to join us today. So we, um, he, he's invited his colleague, Dr. Samba Kolsar instead. Uh, Samba uh, leads the Department of Health Research in the Ministry of Health in Senegal, and also the Research Commission in the National COVID um, Response Commission in, in Senegal. And then finally, you've heard from me already. I'm the Deputy Director of our Health Systems Innovation and Delivery Program at PATH, and really pleased to be with you all here today. So let's kick it off. Okay, I'd like to start with <clears throat> what we've learned from previous shocks and stresses. So Lucy, you and your colleagues from South Africa and from Kenya have done some really fascinating research. This was pre-COVID on what you called the everyday resilience of health workers and managers. We'd love to hear a little bit more about what those everyday shocks were and what you can learn from that research that's relevant today for COVID. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jessica, and hello to everybody who's online. It's very good to be here. So in the work that we did previously, we identified three groups of um, everyday shocks or what we called chronic stress. The first was the unstable and evolving governance structures of our health systems. The second was resource challenges and frequent policy changes. And the third was uh, what we called frontline instability. Now, governance structures are often thought to be static, but in fact, they're constantly changing, especially in times of decentralization uh, and devolution, or even on an everyday basis. Resource challenges are common, but what we perhaps don't recognize is that we also have to deal with many, 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 many frequent policy changes. In South Africa, there's been something called transformation fatigue um, to speak to the multiple changes that have been uh, constant and ongoing. The third area of stress that we identified was frontline instability, um, which includes everything from the everyday interactions between patients and providers, communities and systems that are part of, of, of what, what it takes to provide care, to a range of human resource management issues um, that go from just managing everyday absenteeism and uh, low motivation to something like uh, health worker strikes, um, which occurs in, in some settings. Um, to things like just spending so much time in unproductive meetings that managers actually can't do the jobs that they're supposed to do. So those are just some of the range of shocks. Um, and as I said, we called them uh, chronic stress that every system faces and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. They are common features of health system experience. So what can we learn for now, for now from the work that we've done? I want to raise, raise three issues. The first is that we need systemic responses. And by that, I mean responses that work um, across a system with a range of people, uh, with a range of groups and through relationships. And I want to point to a slightly unusual one, perhaps. And that's the need for a response that brings together those who manage um, support or what are sometimes called corporate services with those responsible for service delivery. We often take for granted that um, somebody somewhere is going to procure the PPE we need, for example. But that needs to work closely with those responsible for actually delivering the services. And systemic responses have to signal value. So let me just continue with the example of PPE. Of course, we need enough PPE, PPE for all if possible. But if there isn't PPE for all, it's really important that the way PPE is distributed is not to privilege the already most privileged. It's as important that cleaners have access to PPE as the most specialist physicians. The third thing I want to emphasize is an approach of leadership that is about enablement and not command and control. And this is true for non-COVID times as well as COVID times. We do need central guidance, we do need central action, but you cannot actually 
deliver care or respond to a crisis through that action. It needs everybody to get involved. We need a leadership based on respect, dignity, trust. We need to enable teams to work together. Um, it's about uh, initiative from the front line to address uh, the pandemic as much it is as, as it, is, it is about uh, central direction. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Lucy. That's really fantastic. And I think as you're talking particularly about leadership from the front lines, we'll hear from Evelyn later, we'll hear from others about how during COVID, we are hearing these amazing examples of um, kind of leadership and resilience and adaptation coming from the bottom up. Um, and, and on the other hand, Lucy, you mentioned that frequent policy change is a hindrance. And I know that we've also heard from many of our countries where we're supporting policy implementation that it's particularly hard right now during COVID um, when a new national guideline is made, for example, to maintain essential health services to, to disseminate that down to the front lines. And so to make sure that there's that fit between what's happening at the national level and the reality of, it, of what's happening on the ground. Um, so that's Thank you, super helpful. And we're gonna go next to Martin. So speaking of what we've learned from the past, Martin, we'd love to hear what lessons USAID has learned from the West Af African Ebola crisis, Zika, other public health crises, and how COVID is similar or different. Thanks. And Martin, I'll just remind you to unmute so we can hear you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, and let me begin by saying I'm extremely honored uh, to be part of this important dialogue uh, on behalf of the Director of Health Systems uh, Office here at USAID. And, and, and I, I very much thank Professor, Gil, uh, Professor Gilson for a very important sort of highlight that provided uh, sort of a really good context in this discussion uh, today. A key lesson learned from West Africa Ebola outbreak, uh, at least from the USAID side, is that these severe outbreaks usually cause really long-term uh, problems to health systems. It takes a long time uh, to return to pre outbreak service provisions levels at the end of pandemic. And as the countries respond to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we should not underestimate the long-term secondary and tertiary impacts. This will include a severe mistrust of health system that makes it harder for health systems to recover and perform afterwards. Clearly, uh, the disruptions of health uh, services uh, due to COVID-19 will roll back a lot of best health outcome gains that we have achieved in the past, uh, in the last decade. A recent review uh, by USAID Momentum Project show, for instance, during the Ebola outbreak, the service utilization rates uh, for antenatal care so dropped by 60%. And there was also equally sort of almost 50% drop in family planning visits and decrease uh, in institutional delivery. So this profound sort of impact to health systems generally when the outbreak in terms of service use and access to services. How is COVID different? Clearly, COVID is much more bigger in scale uh, and is, it, it, it includes lockdowns, uh, guarantee and severe travel restrictions, which are disrupting essential services and also disrupting uh, urgent care and treatment of chronic conditions uh, such as HIV and TB. Healthcare services face shortages of essential commodities and have lost uh, key frontline health workers uh, from the disease. Uh, from, from being sick and of course uh, some have also died. Clearly these sort of disruptions um, add to the barrier uh, of access to health services. People are not able to move, uh, they, they are guarantees, and, and then uh, wait times at facilities have increased significantly as, 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 as most of the speakers will attest today. There are also major shortages of supplies because of travel restrictions, but also just because of the sheer demand. And I think in urban areas, uh, we, will, uh, we will be under a, 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 a bigger threat of accelerated transmission and obviously unrest. And the rural communities are becoming isolated and cut off uh, from the safe supply. And this is a major concern for USAID uh, going forward. We know also that countries are redeploying health workers and, and these health workers are overworked and they will need to be uh, timely paid. And a lot of these countries will not have substantial resources to cover for these additional uh, required uh, resources and that they will need the support uh, from the global community to be able to maintain these services. 
the, the travel restrictions particularly is also causing an additional layer of problems in terms of supply chains, both globally, uh, regionally, and of course, local supply chains. So we are seeing a very sharp decline in quantity of effective uh, medical products um, and, and, and the supplies are, are disrupted. We are con concerned particularly that this will lead to increase in uh, falsified and substandard uh, drugs to enter the market leading to uh, ineffective therapies and potentially uh, sort of re-imaging of drug resistance in some areas. One other uh, point I wanted to make here, which I think is, is, is equally important, is that there is a huge uh, misinformation uh, from everywhere. While uh, the issue differ, misinformation rumors about COVID-19 are present in every region. The USAID concern is that these rumors and misinformation undermine the trust overall uh, and the effectiveness of our response. And they perpetuate uh, the harmful pra practices, uh, including to sowing destruction of, 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 of health facilities and posing danger to care providers everywhere. USAID is particularly concerned about how we can address these rumors because they are also impacting trust in uh, essential life-saving services such as, as vaccine. There's also a, a, a major growing stigma that you, we are all aware uh, of the people who are recovering from uh, the infection or who have contracted infection, which is also disrupting individuals and communities uh, piece. One positive piece that I wanted to highlight just quickly is that we, the, the, there was a, an, an audit uh, from our inspector's general office here, which uh, uh, drew a number of lessons that have been very helpful in responding to the COVID-19. One, for instance, is the need to have a very prompt uh, formation of task force that uh, for organizations like USAID is overseeing how we're deploying resources, including the staff, but also establishing clear guidelines that the countries uh, and, and, and missions can follow in responding to pandemics. The guidelines that uh, we have now as a result of the lessons that we learned from the Ebola are allowing different offices to work much more optimally and ensuring that the resources are targeted and are available immediately. This includes, of course, um, sort of reprogramming some of resources that we have to respond to the pandemic. We also see from the Ebola outbreak that some of the innovations, uh, for example, uh, we had a, a, a grand challenge project and one of the, the winners of that grand challenge, Kinos, created the powder called Highlight to be added to disinfectant that turns disinfectant this, this, this blue so health workers can see when the surface is fully covered. Highlight then fades uh, to colorless to indicate when the area is fully decontaminated. In response to the COVID-19, uh, these innovations has been particularly helpful in disinfecting health facilities. We are also uh, investing uh, majorly on misinformation, working with governments and civil society, for instance, in Burkina Faso, Niger, Gambia, Chad, and Mali, to manage the response uh, to COVID-19 with transparent communication uh, and response. USAID intent in this area particularly is to counter misinformation and disinformation uh, in this highly vulnerable uh, region. And this applies to a whole range of other countries where USAID is active. Thank you. Thank you, Marjan. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to come back to you in a minute. Um, but things you were saying about trust and you were talking, and Lucy was also mentioning trust as being so kind of crucial during this, this point. And um, you were also talking, of course, you're starting to talk about some of the adaptations that, that have been happening in countries and, and the concern, of course, for delivering essential health service, services and maintaining the delivery of essential health services. So I, I wanna just kind of shift us to the present a little bit right now. I'm gonna ask a question of Evelyn in a minute, um, but there is an amazing level of ingenuity, adaptability, and innovation. So Martin, you're also talking about innovation in the responses of countries, of communities, of health workers. And Evelyn, I'd love to kind of shift to you. And this is a time when we need some good news stories, obviously, and would love to hear from you some examples of adaptations that you have made or your colleagues or that you've heard about um, in Kasumu County related to this, to COVID and this crisis. Thanks. Thank you very much, Oh, well then the sound is a little bit funny for me. Uh, Caitlin, was that, is it difficult to hear for you too? 
It's a it's a bit difficult. I wonder if you have another headset or something, Evelyn. Sounds a bit muffled. Try again. Evelyn, will you try? It's a bit muffled. Hmm. We can hear you a little bit, but it's a bit muffled. So let's maybe move on and then we'll come back to you in a minute, okay? And maybe the network will be working better. So we'll come back. Um, okay. I'm going to ask basically the same question of, of Samba, um, and then we'll come back to Evelyn. So Samba, speaking of, we're talking about adaptation, creativity, ingenuity. Senegal as a country is full of, of creativity and ingenuity, innovation um, from communities up to the top. And so Samba, we would love to hear some examples of what communities, health workers, and other stakeholders in Senegal are doing to maintain essential health services and respond to COVID during this time. So over to you, Samba, for examples from Senegal. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in our country, um, we have uh, an experience about uh, Ebola crisis disease. And uh, during this uh, epidemic, we established a system in order to manage uh, this, uh, this uh, problem. And uh, we create an institution. It is a center for emergency and uh, uh, management of uh, epidemic. Um, and uh, we use it in order to uh, manage all activities about epidemic. And when we have uh, this uh, epidemic, uh, COVID-19, we establish a um, national uh, committee about management of epidemic. Uh, and this committee uh, plan all activities and uh, has meeting each day in order to evaluate the process and uh, the number of um, uh, person uh, effects, effect positive of uh, uh, COVID-19, the no number of deaths and the different problem we have in order to adapt our strategy and uh, for the moment we uh, plan um, adaptive process um, in order to uh, create security in the system in the uh, uh, health service center. We create a platform to manage the COVID-19 disease. And we explain community that the other health services function correctly and uh, we also uh, develop a communication strategy in uh, order to uh, push the population to uh, use health service health service system um, and uh, in the process also we uh, develop a lot of 
protocol of health research in order to understand the different reactivity of community and uh, to understand also how can we do uh, in order to uh, strengthen the delivery essential health uh, services and also to maintain the function of health health services um, another strategy we use also in our in our country is the to develop the community engagement we use uh, community workers called bajanu uh, goh in our in our in french see the marin marin de quartier we use this group in order to explain to the other population the different uh, different behavior uh, attitude we can have in order to struggle against covid disease and now uh, the next week we organize a workshop in order to uh, evaluate all strategy we develop and uh, the report can uh, help uh, to have information clear information about our uh, our our activities and for this also we open a network with other country in uh, west in ecowas uh, for example we have a, a ngo water uh, with with him, we create a strategy in order to develop health research on the syst health system in uh, for understanding more understanding uh, the difficulty we have and the different strategy we establish in order to struggle against covid-19 uh, thank you very much thank you so much i think those are just wonderful examples of how of how senegal is using learning right and not research two years from now but research right now and learning embedded as part of the health system um, so really wonderful to hear how you're trying to generate information and data, even your kind of COVID um, data platform is generating data in real time, you're reviewing it every day, uh, you are deploying communication strategies and then monitoring them and testing them and seeing whether they're working. So that example of kind of this embedded adaptive learning is really, really crucial, obviously, for, for resilience. Um, and we have a program of capitalization of all this strategy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the, the networks with other countries in your region too. Um, let's try Evelyn again. Evelyn has turned off her video. So Evelyn, let's see if we can hear you any better now. And so Evelyn, back to you in terms of what are some of the adaptations that you and your colleagues have been making to maintain essential health services during this time? <laughs> Oh no, I think the connectivity is still really poor, unfortunately. Um, so maybe we can keep working on that. Evelyn, it's, I think it's, unfortunately, it's too difficult to hear you still. Um, so we'll keep on working on this. And, and in the meantime, I'm going to go back to Lucy, if that's okay. So Lucy, we've been hearing some examples of resilience, of adaptation happening right now. Um, what we're really interested in, of course, is how do we build that capacity, right? How do we strengthen, continually strengthen the capacities to be resilient? And some of those capacities that you had identified were the cognitive, behavioral, 
and um, contextual capacity. And I think we're hearing of examples of, of all of those coming out in different ways. Um, so I'm really curious, in your opinion, what can we do now to strengthen those capacities at all levels of the health system? And I guess another kind of related point on that though, is we're hearing about, you know, you and Martin um, have, you talked about trust, leadership, these, these almost seem like um, nice to have things. Is it, can we afford right now during COVID to invest in building some of those softer attributes of health systems when we have a, a pandemic to respond to as well? Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. So I think when we're just talking about these capacities, we have to understand that they are not exclusively capacities of individuals. They are capacities of the system and the system, um, but by that I mean of the routines of the system, the processes, the procedures, and the groups of people within the system. And I think when we're talking about resilience, it is essential to understand that we are not talking about leaving it to individuals to manage um, the huge demands by themselves. It has to be a collective response um, in order uh, for us to be able to move through COVID to a post-COVID future. So in terms of building these systemic capacities, I think it is important that we think not only about what interventions we are implementing, but how we implement them. Um, and it isn't a luxury because whatever we do um, implies a how. So if what we do is instruction, command and control, um, framed by quite militaristic um, terms and names, which has happened quite a lot around COVID around the world, then that itself is a how. And the how is to centralize control and to say those in the center know best how to manage. But I think that is a false, um, that is an illusion. I think we need some central control, but we need to enable the wider system. And therefore our hows have, and that is how we will build capacities. They have to focus on how we engage people to take action, how we engage people to work together to take action, how we create um, environments um, that enable that. And that is about really processes of learning. It's about how we do things to support and enable learning. I see there's one question, I'm just gonna put it out there that is about transparency um, with respect to information. And I think that's really crucial. If we control the information, then our how is control. If we're transparent with information, then our how is enablement. So how we enable adaptation and learning is a central thing that we can be doing now that will build these capacities that are essential for the future, not just now. Um, we mustn't rely on individuals. We must work across silos. We must build relationships uh, and we must learn from the bottom. Um, and that includes in engagement with communities, with frontline workers, how to make things work better towards um, addressing COVID and to a brighter future for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. So how can we enable um, wider system resilience, wider system capacities? Martin, I wanna pass this question over to you to answer kind of this question that Lucy's posed, not what should we do, but how can we do that? How, from the perspective of USAID, from a funder's perspective, how can we enable these wider system capacities? I think in most part by listening, and I think uh, developing uh, the capacity to hear communities, uh, to hear uh, ministries, um, just the example that you had from Senegal is a really good, a good example of how to ensure that the funders, particularly like USAID, are hearing what actually is the critical needs of the community and developing appropriate response. One of the, the, the silver lining uh, about uh, uh, COVID-19 is also that it's coming during the age where you have a substantial growth of information and information penetrating uh, all areas of society, including rural communities. So ability to hear the communities, particularly through digital uh, devices and digital technology is enhanced. And I, I think we can do more to kind of listen and learn from the communities about what the critical needs are and what can be done to respond. I said earlier that one of the uh, how is also to understand what kind of information people are getting, particularly when there's misinformation and figuring out 
what we can do as a global community to address it and ensure that people continue to trust their health services and health systems. How in terms of uh, also contributing resources where we can uh, to uh, community programs, particularly the frontline health workers to ensure that at least there is a system uh, of ensuring that the services, essential services are continued, but also routine services too, that like vaccine, are not severely disrupted, uh, leading to uh, the emergence of other sort of uh, huge problems in health systems. So, so, so how primarily by listening, how primarily by using the digital systems that we have, how uh, by uh, responding to what Kwame was raising here, strengthening the information system, particularly ensuring that we are, we are developing a trust uh, between what is flowing from uh, community health centers to, to, to the system. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, we are going to start taking some questions from our audience. So we have some great questions coming in from our the people who are listening and we'll keep on trying to get Evelyn um, back and up because she does have great examples. As a teaser, she has some great examples of adaptations that she and her colleagues have been making in, in Kenya. And I think that's so important to hear those uh, creative kind of on, you know, that's part of the everyday resilience that um, in, in her health system, she has been helping to build and now she can apply it to responding to COVID. So we wanna hear about that and we'll keep on trying to get that. But in the meantime, um, Samba, we have a question for you from the audience. So um, the audience is interested to understand a little bit more the experiences in the field regarding health seeking behavior and specifically, are people going to health centers as usual? Are people using health services in Senegal as they did in the past? Does it differ between rural and urban settings? Um, also, is there any difference between public and private settings? So if you have any insights on that from Senegal, that would be really great. Thanks, Samba. Um, Just a reminder to unmute Samba. Excuse me, um, I discussed with uh, my, my, my colleague. Uh, I think it is uh, uh, important to um, develop um, uh, capacity building uh, for the health, research, for the health uh, workers um, in order to develop uh, uh, process adapt adapted to the crisis or epidemic uh, in um, the this situation we have two groups we have the community or the users of health system and the health workers and they must change their attitude, the community and the health, health workers. They need to work together in order to uh, struggle against uh, COVID-19. Uh, That's why uh, um, in uh, the health system, we elaborate a, a plan, a operational plan of resilience. Uh, this operational plan of resilience is elaborated by all the actors of uh, our, our country. We have the uh, different uh, partners and uh, the economic aspect, social aspect, uh, the, 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 the aspect of um, uh, agriculture uh, and the transport and so on and so. We discuss together in order to elaborate a plan of repost it is a resilient, a resilient plan. And the uh, principal acts of 
this plan is the health system. It is how can we do in order to protect the health system in order to strengthen the health system to manage this, uh, this epidemic. And uh, we uh, receive different support from the community. The community uh, try to uh, discuss with the health system in order to uh, verify how can they do in order to, to, help, to help us. But the, the problem we have, we have uh, is um, the, the scientific communication. We change uh, each day the, 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 the scientific communication because we have a new knowledge about the virus and we come back to say to the, communi to, uh, to the community, now you can do this, no, no, now we, we, we don't do this and so on, so on. This is a, a, a problem between the system and the community. And we uh, need to use a pedagogic uh, communication in order to uh, create confidence between the system and the community. Because the first, the community say that it's not a, a epidemic. It's not a reality. They don't, uh, they don't accept that it is a problem. And uh, when we begin, we start our, 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 our communication, it is very, very difficult to uh, uh, convince community to respect what we, we, we say, we say to, to, to do. That uh, it is uh, some uh, uh, some difficulty we have, and now the result we have from the health research uh, give us some knowledge, and now we can uh, develop uh, some uh, activities about about this uh, new knowledge. We, we, we have from the, from the research. Thank you. Thank you, Samba. And as um, Samba mentioned, Senegal is actually developing a plan right now on resilience, a, a plan for um, building health systems and strengthening health systems resilience. And so it's very exciting to hear. Um, that is obviously a plan coming from the top. And so I wanna shift back to Lucy. Lucy asked you a question. You've said a couple times that, you know, in terms of the how we have to move away from a command and control mode of leadership towards, you know, one that's more decentralized, dispersed. Um, you know, I think people are interested to hear from maybe a political economy, political economy perspective, how do we actually do that in, in, a, in a, a country or a jurisdiction where it's kind of in, Trenched to have this more command and control type style. How do you shift away from that? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and I saw the question, and it's a great question. Um, and um, so I have two responses, three responses. The first is it's going to take time. The second is COVID allows us to think differently, and thinking is the first step to action. Um, and there may be things we can do in this time that simply would not otherwise be possible. Um, but the third is it needs political action. And that means that uh, we all have to get involved in um, responding politically um, to COVID at a local level, a national level, and at a global level um, in order to contribute to creating an environment where power is um, more widely shared. Um, 
but of course, uh, you know, being idealistic is great and we also have to accept some limits on it. But if we don't start thinking politically, then we won't be able to move forward. Thanks. I'm curious, there's another great question that somebody has asked, which is related to, um, to accessing healthcare. Financial access is already a challenge. With COVID now, people are suffering economically and financially, and maybe have even fewer resources to access healthcare. You know, I personally think that one of the most transformative changes that some countries could explore would be to either remove, remove user fees or extend health insurance coverage. And again, there's a window to do this through COVID. It aligns with UHC goals. I'm just curious if the panelists have heard any examples of this kind of really transformative strategy to maintain access to health services during this time, if there's a country that stands out in having done that. This is for any of the panelists. Uh, this is Lucy, and I'm afraid I don't know the country that's done that. I've only been aware of examples where the financial challenges to accessing services have, have been exacerbated through COVID. Um, I, I do know uh, of examples, it's a little bit aligned, but, but a different one, of examples where countries have sought to um, leverage, um, uh, leverage engagements with the private sector to the benefit of the population at large um, through purchasing arrangements that, um, that then um, are part of also what we discuss under the UHC label. And COVID allows that sort of opportunity. But it's not the same as simply removing the fees that we know in quiet times, never in COVID, uh, not only in COVID, are dire, have dire impacts for people. Yeah, similarly, I think it's in actually WHO guideline uh, uh, that, that came out uh, earlier about how to respond to pandemic to suspend user fees uh, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in countries where user fees are applicable to essential services. Um, but that, I, I think there are many sort of experiences on how that has been sort of unfolding in different countries. And I think um, this, this is where maybe learning more from what countries are doing with regard to this uh, pandemic, I think it's, it is going to be uh, useful. But I know at least it's in the guidance of WHO. There, there was a question, uh, Jessica, about how, how do we deal with silos, uh, which I was just quickly going to address. And I think this is really important because I think what Lucy is saying in terms of uh, command control, it's something that is coming from uh, the tradition of public health uh, system, uh, or at least public health functions that we have, which is uh, a combination of uh, con uh, sort of regulations and authorities around how to sort of manage the food and other supplies, and then linking that with obviously sort of disease prevention. And I think the one way of dealing with silos is, uh, you know, clearly, I think if you look at uh, USAID's uh, Global Health Security Agenda that it's launched this year, is sort of pushing towards making public health interventions clearly more linked with health system strengthening. Because then we start having a much more powerful dialogue, not just at the central level, but at the community level, particularly at the primary health care, of what actually are essential actions that communities can take. And the voices from the ground start sort of becoming an important part of the dialogue in terms of informing public health. And so the, the linkages between you know, public health functions or public health activities that are sort of um, in, in implemented sometimes outside Ministry of Health in, in some countries, and health system strengthening, which is what we're talking about here, is a critical part of dealing with that silo because the essential services have this primary health care component for which community is an integral part of that. And in that sense, you're actually encouraging at least uh, removing the silos by bringing the community voice in this uh, dialogue. And so that, that would be one way I will see uh, uh, as going forward, linking the global health security agenda, which is sort of a bigger sort of agenda globally supported by many countries with health system strengthening specifically by using health system strengthening to open up uh, sort of the, the community health, a community health component into the bigger discussions around public health interventions. 
Martin, thank you so much for that. And um, you have so much influence as such an important funder, USAID, that I think we all ask you, I mean, and you've been trained by Lucy and you have such rich experience. So please <laughs> continue to, um, to break down those silos, to integrate these different agendas. And uh, yeah, one can imagine that there are many, you know, transformative actions that you can take and your colleagues can take now that could change the future of, of health systems and public health and essential health services. So thank you. We're going to shift, hopefully, to Evelyn. Evelyn, um, we're going to try Evelyn one more time to finish off our conversation. Evelyn, can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Are you able to oh, hear we can me? hear you so clearly. Thank you. So thank Evelyn... You. Maybe you can end us off in the last few minutes. Um, we'd love to hear, again, same question. What have you been doing? So please, you can end us with hope about um, adaptation and resilience that's happening, happening where you are. Thanks. Oh, Evelyn, now we can't hear you. Yes, thank you very much, Kelvin. And we've done in our facility where I work. One to waiting bay to outside under trees for clients and patients to observe social distance in the congestion and clients have not complained and the staffs also feel comfortable to stand from the clinical room to go out and call class by name for them to come in for consultation services. We've, have, we've also availed hand washing facilities in every department or in every service delivery room and in count we have at least 15 points so that we maintain high and hand hygiene and staffs and clients are able to be clean and to be safe as they're being attended to. We maintain micro teachings, but we also have to sandwich facts on COVID-19 because different clients come to the facility every day. And we cannot assume that all of them have the information about COVID-19. And that is a culture that we do and we practice and we have assigned ourselves topics and including students when they come in the facility. Uh, in the outpatient, we have designated a space, a room for isolation. And in this room, we have displayed surveillance protocols and rapid response focal persons phone number to call in case of suspected case. Again, in the outpatient, we have deliberately reorganized and deployed more clinicians for consultation services so that patients are, are attended to swiftly. This will reduce the client waiting time and also builds clients confidence in the service delivery. As a facility, we have also worked together with the community. We have done a schedule to involve the community healthcare workers, that's why we call them here, to volunteer their services to help in the screening of every client, every person who works in the facility and to ensure that they so that we are sure Evelyn, to handle sorry. a client who is also well taken care of. Are you getting me? Sorry. Getting, are you? Yes, you're you, starting. You, to, you're starting to break up a little bit, um, but we heard, we did hear some really wonderful examples that you provided um, of the adaptations that your facility is making. Um, I think one of my favorites that I heard was the micro teaching. This idea of yes. 
Microsoft. using community structures. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we are also using the community structure. That is the community health to help us in screening of all clans and to ensure that they maintain the facility in terms of cleanliness. All clans who visit the facility or the hospital must also wear face masks. They'll be... So in other words, Evelyn, I might, we're, I know we're running out of time, but maybe just to recap, um, one thing I... For elevated body... Evelyn, one thing I hear from, from what you're saying is that right, this is you everyone... They must also wash their hands with Alan. soap entrance as they get in before they wait for consultation services. I think one thing I'm hearing is that this is everyone's, everyone is working together in Kasumu County to face this challenge. So we're hearing about community health volunteers, the health workers, patients um, coming together to, to collaborate and to coordinate efforts. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, I want to express my gratitude to our speakers today. Thank you so much for joining us to share your ideas and expertise with us. It was really great to hear everyone's perspectives. And thank you so much for the, um, the, the audience participants, for your excellent questions, for your engagement. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this and hopefully this sparks other, other ideas. Um, and so whether, you know, whether PATH is new to you or you, you have followed us for a long time, we appreciate you joining us today and please stay in touch and, and thank you to everyone who's, whatever you're doing, big and small, to, to respond to COVID and to maintain essential health services during this time. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.